Thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to this conference and giving me the chance to um, present my work here. First of all, let me mention my topic. Um, I worked on irreversible effects in polycrystalline shaped memory loss, and there I worked on uh, fatigue effects. Let me also mention my co-authors, my former supervisors at the Ruhr Universität of Bochum, Klaus Hackel and Philipp Juncker. Here's now the outline of my talk. I will start with a short motivation. I will show you um, yeah, what shaped memory alloys are and what problems we have in there because we have um, transformations from austenite to martensite and um, these um, transformations um, result in material properties which make them very attractive for um, industrial applications. For example, here presented for stands. After the motivation, I will present the variation of material model which um, couples phase transformations with um, the formation of irreversible martensite. And in the end, I will um, give an outlook of um, this talk. Here you can see now the effect of functional fatigue. We can see here a classical um, hysteresis curve here for a cyclic tension test by Wagner in 2003. And the main um, yeah, material behavior is given by this transformations, as I mentioned before. So we have here this um, first plateau. So we have loading and we have a linear elastic relation between um, yeah, stress and strain. But then at a certain stress, our transformation is initiated. So also to, um, due to mechanical loading. And we have a transformation from the um, initially austenitic material to martensite. If we then unload our material, then we have um, again a linear behavior between um, strain and stress. Until reaching this um, lower plateau, there we have the back transformation to austenite. And now we have the problem then um, that um, if we cycle our material, then uh, we have this decrease of the plateau stresses, particularly for the upper one, and we also have the formation of a remaining strain. The reason for that is given by Kroos. He examined the structure of shape memory alloys and there he showed that um, we have a formation of dislocations during the um, transformation and these dislocations are stabilizing the martensite. So the martensite is not able to transform back. And that is something we wanted to model. So we included the reversible transformation from austenite to martensite and coupled it with an irreversible transformation. There are a lot of other material models working on that topic. Let me just show them to you and go to um, our material model. So first of all, I want to show you the variables I will use. Um, we have a strain and a temperature, epsilon and uh, theta. We have different phases. We have one austenite and we have small and different martensitic phases. Every phase is characterized by um, a transformation strain, the reversible ones and also the irreversible ones. And these transformation strains are um, given by experiments. In addition to that, I used internal variables to describe my microstructure. We um, have a volume fraction, a reversible one, and an irreversible martensitic volume fraction. And in addition, I used a set of Euler angles to describe the polycrystalline structure of the material. That means we have here a polycrystal, so we have different oriented grains. And instead of calculating the phase transformations in every grain, which comes along with a high numerical effort or um, large um, calculation times, we are calculating the um, averaged orientation of the transformation which is taking place. And so our um, effort is um, highly reduced. In addition to that, we have a temperature dependent part of the Helmholtz free energy, which describes somehow the stability of every phase at the given temperature. And to take into account the set of Euler angles, we have a rotation tensor Q. Now I'm working with variational methods. We already heard some talks in the morning uh, related to variational modeling. But let me mention um, the main idea of it. So um, everything is based on the assumption that every material, every body um, prefers a state where the energy is minimized. So the idea of variational concepts is 
that we formulate an energetic term, which includes the information of our microstructure, for example, or in the talk in the morning about the atomistic um, scale, for example. And then we minimize this energy term and get um, our actual state of our body for a given displacement, for example. The method I used is the principle of the minimum of the dissipation potential. And it is um, based on the idea that we have a Lagrange function, which is divided into two parts. We have the rate of the free Helmholtz energy on the one hand, which depends on the internal variables and on the strain and the temperature. And in addition to that, we have a dissipation function which describes the energy that is necessary so that our microstructure change can take place. In addition to that, we can um, very easily um, consider constraints that have to be fulfilled. I will later comment on that. Then we have our energetic description of our material, and then we minimize it with respect to the rates of the internal variables. And this minimization comes directly along with evolution equations for our internal variables. So first of all, we now have to find um, the um, yeah, the Helmholtz free energy and the dissipation function. Let's start with the Helmholtz free energy. And here we can see um, a Roy's energetic um, bound or the resulting Helmholtz free energy. We have this term and in there we have some effective quantities for um, the transformation strains and also for the stiffness and the caloric energy, which are calculated as somehow some um, volume averages. For the transformation strains, we also rotate it in the direction given by um, the set of Euler angles. We now need the rate of it, so we can use the chain rule to calculate it. And in here we are defining the thermodynamic driving forces, which can be calculated by taking the derivative of the energy with respect to the internal variables. Then we get these formulations. The second part in here is the dissipation function we have to define and we divide it into two parts. One for the coupled um, phase transformations and one for um, the rotations. And now we, um, yeah, in the way we are choosing it, we can decide what kind of um, evolution equations we want to get. In here we are choosing this um, combined or coupled approach for um, the phase transformations, the reversible and the irreversible ones. And this approach will result in a rate independent evolution equations. It's homogeneous of first order. So in here we have this dissipation parameter RT, which describes somehow the energetic barrier which has to be overcome before our um, evolution can start. That means something like a yield limit. In addition to that, we have some coupling factors F and G, which take into account that different amounts of energy are necessary to form irreversible or reversible martensite. And in addition to that, our F is um, a linear function in the total irreversible martensite to take into account the irreversible effects in our materials and so the decrease of the plateau stresses. So in addition to that, we need a dissipation function for our rotation and I um, used the formulation by Juncker. Here we have this homogeneous of second order um, formulation and that will result in evolution equations of viscoelastic type. It looks a little bit um, complicated, but um, yeah, it's um, due to the objectivity of our problem. We also have some constraints which have to be fulfilled. We have the mass conservation, so the sum of um, all, um, all um, volume fractions is one, or when it's guaranteed for the first um, time step or for the initialization, then the change is equal to zero. In addition to that, our internal or our volume fractions are non-negative, of course. We have an irreversibility condition of the irreversible volume fraction, and we have no um, austenitic stabilization um, during the experiment, so we said that our rho zero is equal to zero. In addition to that, we have a maximum value, which is also given by experiments for the irreversible Martin side. And so we assume this quantity. So we have some, um, some material parameters in it. The um, factors F and G, for example, and also this rho max 
All of them are calibrated to experiments, but I will not show it today. So we can consider all of these constraints using the Grange and Kuntaka parameters. And now we can insert all the um, equations into the Lagrange function. I will not show it here, but believe me, we will then um, minimize this problem. And the minimization directly results in the evolution equations, as mentioned before. So we get this viscose evolution equations for the Euler angles. And to calculate the evolution equations for our um, volume fractions, we have to use an active set strategy. That means that we define an active set, which includes all the phases which are there or will start to form in the same time step. With use of these active sets, we can calculate the evolution equations for the um, volume fractions. And in here we have beta, which is a consistency parameter and which couples both evolution equations. In addition to that, we have this active deviator, which is calculated in that way. And it's somehow comparing the um, driving force of the phase I with the average driving force of the active sets. Now, um, beta is a function still of our um, evolution equations, so that's a problem, but it's a scalar. So we can quantify it now by um, performing a Legendre transformation of our dissipation function, and this Legendre transformation directly results in a yield function and in the well-known Kuntaka conditions. Now our material model is set, and now we can come to some uh, results. Here we can see a cyclically loaded wire with two different meshes. And here we have um, the uh, resulting stress strain diagram. The initial Euler angles are now for the first um, example randomly chosen because we have to do something for the first step. Then it's correcting and getting to the converged solution. So here we can see the, um, yeah, the material behavior we also saw in the experiment. We have the decrease of the plateau stresses, particularly of the upper one, and we have this formation of the remaining strain. The drop between the um, first two cycles is very um, large. The reason for that is the initial choice of the oil angles. We will see that later again. And we can see that our results, which are tested not only for the two meshes, are mesh independent. In addition to that, here we have the absolute value for the total Martin side, and we can see that everything is converging. Let's now compare, um, or first of all, have a look on the um, results for um, the orthonetic volume fraction. Here we can see the formation of the orthonetic volume fraction, or um, yeah, the areas where the Martin side, Martin side forms. And in the same areas, of course, we have the formation of the irreversible Martin side, which is then um, not transforming back, of course, due to the irreversibility condition. Um, it's not working anymore. Ah, okay, thanks. So let's now compare everything with um, experimental data. Here we can see, again, the um, test by um, Wagner. And now... <laughs> Um, here we have um, our results, so we come to good results, but our convergence is lower in the moment. The reason for that is that we do not have any dislocations in our um, simulations, but they are definitely there in the experiment, and so um, they are triggering somehow the um, transformations, and we cannot show that in the moment, because in the moment we are calculating with a perfect material without any voids and so on. Thanks. Um, another example is given by this clamping ring, which is also cyclically loaded. And here we can see the resulting stress strain diagram, again with a randomly um, chosen set of um, initially um, or initial Euler angles. And here we can see that this choice wasn't that optimal. But we can see again the convergence of our material and the decrease of the plateau stresses. <laughs> One back. And you could click on the <laughs> on the presentation. Yep. I'll do that. So this one. Yeah. yeah, so here we can see now the um, transformation from the austenite on the left, and in the same areas the formation of the irreversible martensite. 
and yeah, for 10 load cycles, I think. And we can see that these, um, these areas which are not transforming becoming smaller with time. So let me finally conclude my talk. I showed you a variation of material model which is able to show the um, effect of functional fatigue by coupling a reversible and an irreversible transformation. We had um, evolution equations of elastoplastic type for the phase transformations and of viscoelastic type for the Euler angles. Um, the parameters used are all calibrated to experiments and um, I used the dynamic evolution of the orientation distribution function instead of calculating the phase transformation for every grain. In the future, we have to do a more intensive validation of um, our, um, of our um, simulations. We are also working with um, yeah, Aaron Stepner from the US to um, um, validate our approach for the polycrystal. In addition to that, we plan in Aachen to um, examine the interactions of dislocations with phase runs directly on a lower scale. So, in the end of my talk, uh, thank you and thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much.